Dr. Michael Greger is a physician, New York Times best-selling author, and internationally recognized at the Conference on World Affairs, testified before Congress, and was invited as an expert witness in the defense of Oprah Winfrey in the infamous meat defamation trial. Dr. Greger. Dr. Greger is a graduate of Cornell University School of Agriculture and Tufts University School of Medicine. As I'm sure everyone knows, his book, How Not to Die, became an instant New York Times bestseller. And please. Stop by to pick that up at the bookstore, as well as his new How Not to Die cookbook. He's also going to have two book signings coming up tomorrow and Friday at 7.30 p.m. That's in your More than a thousand of his nutrition videos are available at nutritionfacts.org with new videos and articles uploaded every day. Please give a special holistic holiday and see welcome to Dr. Michael Greger. Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. 
those of you who are familiar with my work, every year I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, so busy folks like you Most groundbreaking, most practical findings in new videos in order to upload every day by an to my nonprofit site, <coughs> nutritiontracks.org. Everything on the website is free! Yeah. There are no ads, no corporate sponsorships, strictly not commercial, not selling anything. Just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to your grandmother. Program. what Pritikin did for my family. New videos and articles every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. <laughs> so where did Pritikin get his evidence from? Well, a network of missionary hospitals set up throughout Sub-Saharan Africa uncovered what may be the most important medical advance, um, according to one of our most uh, preeminent medical figures of the last century, Dr. Dennis Birkin, the fact that many of our major and commonest diseases were universally rare, like heart disease. In the African population of Uganda, for example, coronary heart disease was almost non-existent. He said, wait a second, our number one killer almost non-existent, what were they eating? Well, they were eating lots of vegetables, right? and grains, wow. and greens, and their protein almost entirely from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, very similar to what one sees in modern day plant eaters. And for those of you uh, using a um, more rational metric system, we're down, this is down to about 3.8, 3.9, something like that. Um, he said, wait a second. Maybe they were just dying early from something else. Never lived long enough to get heart disease. No, here's age match heart attack rates in Uganda versus St. Louis. At 632 autopsies in Uganda, only one myocardial infarction. At 632 age and gender matched autopsies in Missouri, 136 myocardial infarctions, more than 100 times the rate of our leading killer. In fact, they were so blown away, went back, did another 800 autopsies in Uganda. Still, just that one small healed infarct, maybe it wasn't even the cause of death, out of 1,426. Less than one in a thousand. Whereas here, heart disease is an epidemic. Right? Here's a list of diseases commonly found here in places that eat and live like the U.S but were rare or even non-existent in populations centering their diets around whole plant foods. These are among our commonest diseases, like obesity, for example, hiatal hernia, the most common stomach problem, varicose veins and hemorrhoids, the two most common venous problems, colorectal cancer, leading cancer killer, Diverticulosis, the most common disease of the intestines. Appendicitis, number one cause of emergency abdominal surgery. Gallbladder disease, number one cause of non-emergency abdominal surgery, as well as ischemic heart disease, our number one cause of death here. But a rarity among plant-based populations, which suggests that heart disease may be a choice. Like cavity. Now, if you look at the teeth of people who lived 10,000 years before the invention of the toothbrush, pretty much no cavity. Didn't brush a day in their lives. No flossing. Yeah, no cavities. Why? Because candy bars hadn't been invented yet. Okay, so why do people continue to get cavities when we know they're preventable through dietary changes? Well, simple because the pleasure people derive from dessert may outweigh the cost and discomfort of the dentist chair. And look, that's fine, right? As long as you're aware of the consequences, right? If you're an adult, you think the benefits outweigh the risks for you and your family, then go for it, right? I certainly enjoy the occasional indulgence. I've got a good dental plan. <laughs> but what if instead of uh, talking about the plaque on our teeth, we're talking about the plaque building up inside of our arteries. Another 
disease that can be preventable through changes in our diet. Okay, now, what are the consequences for you and your family? Okay, now we're not talking about scraping tartar anymore. Now we're talking life and death. It's still up to each of us to make our own decisions as to what to eat and how to live, but we should make these choices consciously, educating ourselves about the predictable consequences of our actions. Atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, is a disease that begins in childhood. By age 10, nearly all kids raised in the standard American diet already have what are called fatty streaks, the first stage of the disease building up inside their arteries. These fatty streaks then turn into plaques in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then can start killing us all. And our heart can cause a heart attack, and our brain, the same disease process, can cause a stroke. So if there is anyone here this evening, older than age 10, <laughs> then, the, then the question, is not whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease. It's whether you want to reverse the heart disease you likely already have, whether you know it or not. But is that even possible? You know, when researchers took people with heart disease, put them on the kind of plant-based diet followed by populations that did not get epidemic heart disease, their hope was, hey, maybe we can slow the disease down a little bit. Maybe even Stop it. But instead, something miraculous happened. As soon as people stopped eating artery-clogging diets, their bodies were able to start dissolving some of that plaque away, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, suggesting their bodies want to be healthy all along, but were just never given the chance. That remarkable improvement in blood flow to the heart muscle itself was after just three weeks of plant-based nutrition. Let me share with you what's called the best kept secret in all of medicine. The best kept secret in medicine is that sometimes, given the right conditions, the body can actually heal itself. You know if you, uh, you know, whack your shin really hard on a coffee table, you can get all red, hot, painful, swollen, inflamed, but will heal naturally if you just stand back let your body work its magic. But what if you kept whacking your shin in the same place day after day? In fact, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> you'd never, you'd, you'd go to your doctor and be like, oh, my shin hurts. And the doctor would be like, no problem. Whip out their pad, write a prescription for painkiller. You still whack your shit three times a day, still really hurts like heck, but oh, I feel so much better with those pain pills on board. Thank heavens for modern medicine. <laughs> it's like when people take those nitroglycerin pills for crushing chest pain. Tremendous relief. You're not doing anything to treat the underlying cause of the disease. Right? Our body wants to come back to health if we let it. But if we keep re-damaging ourselves three times a day, we may never heal. It's like smoking. One of the most amazing things I learned in all my medical training was that within about 15 years of stopping smoking, your lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Using your lungs can clear out all that tar, and eventually it's almost as if you never started smoking at all. And every morning of our smoking life, that healing process starts until wham! First cigarette of the day. Re-injuring our lungs with every puff, just like we can re-injure our arteries with every bite. When all we had to do all along, the miracle cure is to just stand back, stop re-injuring ourselves, and let our body's natural healing processes bring us back towards health. The body's a is a self-healing machine. Sure, you can choose moderation, hit yourself with a smaller hammer. <laughs> but why beat yourself up at all?
This is nothing new. 1977 American Heart Journal cases like Mr. F.W. here, heart disease so bad couldn't even make it to the mailbox, started eating healthier. A few months later, climbing mountains, no pain. Uh, All right. Wow. Now, there are these fancy new classes of anti angina drugs on the market now. Costs thousands of dollars a year, but hey, at the highest dose, may be able to extend exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. <laughs> wow. Doesn't look like those choosing the drug route are going to be climbing mountains anytime soon. <laughs> See, plant based diets aren't too safer and cheaper, they can work better because you're treating the underlying cause of the disease. All right, heart disease number one, leading cause of death. What I'd like to do today is go through all 15 leading causes of death, talk about the role of diet. Great plan preventing, arresting, and reversing each of our top 15 killers, but in a certain sense, right, what more do we need to know? Uh, there's only one diet that's ever been proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, a plant-based diet. So anytime someone tries to sell you on some new diet they heard about, do me a favor. Ask them one simple question. So wait a second. Has this diet been proven to reverse heart disease? The number one reason me and all my loved ones will die? Uh, if the answer is no, why would you even consider it? Right? If that's all a plant-based diet could do, reverse the number one killer of men and women, uh, shouldn't that be the default diet to prove it otherwise? That can also be so effective preventing arresting or other leading killers like type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure, as we'll talk about, would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. But let's see what uh, what uh, what happens when we put cancer on a plant-based diet, which is killer number two. Dr. Dean Ornish, um, after conquering our number one killer, heart disease, moved on to killer number two. Um, I was able to show a shrinkage of tumors, a reversal of the progression of early stage prostate cancer with the same plant-based diet and nutrition program, and no wonder. You take um, people, put them on a plant-based diet, uh, but you take people um, uh, eating standard American diet, drip their blood on the cancer cells growing in a petri dish, and you can suppress cancer cell growth by about 9%. Right? But you put people on a plant-based diet for a year, though, and their blood can do this. The blood circulating throughout the bodies of those eating plant-based has nearly eight times the stopping power when it comes to suppressing cancer cell growth. Now, this was in men with prostate cancer cells. They wanted to repeat the study using women and breast cancer, number one cancer killer specific to women. But look, they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Women are dying now. So let's see what just a plant-based diet uh, can do after just two weeks after, against three different lines of human breast cancer. This is the before cancer cell growth power and weight at 100%. This is after eating healthy for just two weeks. Here's a representative photo micrograph, a photograph taken under a microscope. What they did is they laid down a layer of breast cancer, what they call a confluent layer, kind of a carpet of breast cancer into a petri dish. And then they drip the blood of women needing the standard American diet onto that cancer. And you can see it kind of breaks the cancer up. So this started out all cancer, but it breaks this cancer up into kind of these cancer continents here. But then you take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet retest two weeks later. So same when they act in their own controls. So this is the before. Put them on a plant-based diet. Two weeks later, you lay down another carpet of breast cancer cells, drip their blood. Two weeks later, all you're left with is this. Just a few individual cancer cells left. Their bodies cleaned up. All right. Before and after eating healthy. It's like they're an entirely different new person in some. Right. Their bloodstream became that much more inhospitable to cancer. Now, slowing cancer growth down is nice. Getting rid of it is even better. This is what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. Your body's able to reprogram cancer cells, forcing them to early retirement. 
This is what's called tunnel imaging, measuring DNA fragmentation or cell death, where dying cancer cells show up as little white spots. So for example, here's a dying cancer cell. Again, this is the before. Um, this is what the blood of a uh, woman in the standard American diet would kill off a few cancer cells, not totally defenseless, right? If you take these same women two weeks later, and their blood can do this. The same blood now circulating throughout these women's bodies gained the power to significantly slow down and stop breast cancer cell growth after just two weeks eating healthy. What kind of, what kind of bloodstream do we want? What kind of immune system, right? Do we want one that just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want one circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop? Now, this was after two weeks of a plant-based diet and exercise. They had these women out walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. So, whoa, wait a second. If you do two things, I mean, how do you know what role the diet played? So, researchers decided to put it to the test. Um, and so, uh, this is uh, what we saw before. This is measuring apoptosis uh, program, so the basic cancer cell clearance. This is the effect of diet and exercise. In fact, in this case, on average for 14 years, healthy, plant-based eating for 14 years, along with um, uh, daily mild exercise, like going out for a walk every day, right? So, um, uh, um, healthy diet, mild exercise, that's the kind of cancer um, cell clearance you can get. Compare that to the cancer-stopping power of your average sedentary American. See a little cheeseburger, if you can see one. Um, <laughs> which is essentially non-existent. All right, okay, but here's the interesting group in the middle. What about 14 years standard American diet, but 14 years daily strenuous hour-long exercise like calisthenics? <laughs> they wanted to know if you exercise long enough, if you exercise hard enough, can you rival some strolling plant eaters over here? And the answer is exercise help. No question. But literally 5,000 hours in the gym, no match for a plant-based diet. Here's that same tunnel imaging we saw before. Again, even if you're a couch potato living off of fried potatoes, you're not totally defensive, so you can knock off a few cancer cells. You exercise for 5,000 hours, you can kill off cancer cells left and right, but nothing appears to kick more cancer tush than a plant-based diet. And this, we think, is because animal protein, meat, egg white, and dairy protein, increases the levels in our body of a cancer-promoting growth hormone called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, um, uh, which uh, is involved in the uh, acquisition and progression of malignant tumors in human beings. But if you start eating healthy, within weeks, your levels of IGF-1 in your blood drop. And if you continue to eat healthy, um, their levels drop even further. And your levels of IGF-1 binding protein go up. IGF-1 binding protein is like our body's emergency break, right? Sure, in as few as two weeks, you can drop your body's production of IGF-1, but wait a second. What about all the IGF-1 you have circulating in your body from the bacon and eggs you had three weeks ago? Right? Well, your body releases this snatch squad of binding proteins, like your body's emergency break on excessive, controlling excessive cell growth. Your protective levels go up within weeks, Benefits continue to accrue the longer you eat healthy. Here's the experiment really nailed. IGF-1 is the villain. Uh, same thing we saw before, healthy diet and exercise. Uh, cancer cell growth drops, cancer cell death shoots up. But here's the interesting column here. What if you add back to the cancer just the amount of IGF-1 you banished from your system because you started eating healthy, what happened? You essentially erase the diet and exercise effect. It's almost as if you never started eating as healthy at all. So that's why um, we think uh, you know, some of the largest studies on diet and cancer in history have found that um, um, the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among those eating more plant-based because they're eating less animal protein, less meat, egg, white, and dairy protein. So they have less IGF-1 circulated in their system, and so they have less cancer growth. How much less cancer growth are we talking about? Um, well, um, this uh, famous study published in the journal called Cell Metabolism found that those in middle age 
You're starting eating a lot of protein. About 75% increased risk of dying prematurely across the board, and four times risk of specifically dying from cancer, but not all protein, specifically animal protein. Um, the, um, and uh, this makes sense, given the IGF-1 story we just talked about. The academic institution where this study was done sent out a press release with a memorable opening line. That chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette. Explaining that, look, I mean, quadrupling one's risk of dying from cancer, I mean, that's comparable to one's, to, you know, smoking cigarette. So, what was the response in the scientific community to this revelation that diets high meat, eggs, and dairy can be harmful to health of smoking? Well, one nutrition scientist said it was potentially dangerous to tell people about this study. Why? Because a smoker might think, hey, why bother quitting smoking if my hammer cheese sandwich is just a bad one? Wow. So let's not tell anyone about this whole meat and cheese thing. Shh. That reminds me of this famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the um, uh, downplay the uh, um, uh, the risk of secondhand smoke by saying, "Hey, you think secondhand smoke is bad? Increasing the risk of lung cancer 19 percent. Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day three times is bad. 62 percent increased risk of lung cancer. Doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil, tripling your risk." Uh, by eating of heart disease, by eating non-vegetarian, multiplying your risk sixfold, by eating lots of meat and dairy, so they conclude, well, let's keep the perspective here. Oh <laughs> the risk from secondhand smoke may be well below that of other everyday activities, so breathe deep. Right? It's like saying, yeah, don't worry about getting stabbed. Getting shot, oh, so much worse. How about neither? Two wrists don't make a right. <laughs> of course, you'll know Philip Moore stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. Wow. Just saying. All right, kill number one, heart disease kill number two is cancer. Um, and killer number three used to be stroke, but oh, that's so 2007. Now it's COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease like emphysema. Thankfully, eating plant based diet may reduce one's risk of getting COPD in the first place. It can be even used to treat COPD, significantly improving lung function over time, something we didn't even think was possible, whether due to the anti inflammatory, antioxidant effects of fresh produce, but pretty exciting stuff. Although the tobacco industry viewed these landmark findings a little differently. I mean, if adding plants to one's diet can improve lung function, wouldn't it be easier to add plants to cigarettes? And indeed, uh. the addition of a sign berries to cigarettes evidently is a protective effect against emphysema and smoking mice. Next, I'm going to start adding berries to meat. And indeed, I couldn't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. The addition, the addition of, uh, of, uh, of fruit extracts to burger patties was not without its glitches. For example, the blackberries dyed the burger patties the stink purplish color, kind of turned people off a little bit. Um, though, uh, and uh, uh, but you can improve the tenderness of lamb carcasses if you infuse them before rigor mortis sets in with uh, kiwi fruit juice. You can oh. even um, improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding powdered grape seeds, though there were complaints of the grape seed particles becoming visible in the final product. And look, I mean, if we, if we know one thing about hot dog eaters, is that they're picky about what goes in their food. <laughs> Now, killer number four is indeed stroke. Preventing strokes uh, may be all about eating potassium-rich foods, um, uh, yet um, uh, most 
Uh, Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum um, daily intake of potassium. And by most, I mean more than 98% of Americans. More than 98% of Americans eat potassium deficient diets because more than 98% of Americans don't eat enough plants. Potassium comes from the words pot, ash, take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce it to ash, you're left with pot, ash, yum, potassium, so called vegetable alkali. Um, but who can name me one plant food in particular high in potassium? Banana, of course, banana. This is coming wherever I go all across the world. I'm talking about this. That's like the, the one universal thing. Everybody seems to know about nutrition, right? They don't know anything about it, but they know bananas have I don't know if like Chiquita has a great PR firm or whatever, but it turns out bananas don't even make the top 50 sources of potassium. Coming in at number 86, uh, right behind fast food vanilla milkshakes. So that's right. Uh, that It's funny, when I was writing How Not to Die, I went back to the USDA nutrient database to make sure they hadn't expanded. They actually have expanded now. Bananas don't even make the top thousand sources. Um, coming in at number one, I think 1,161, right after Reese's Pieces. I kid you not. Um, uh, so the most concentrated source of potassium in our diet, number one, greens. And yes. number two, beans. And number three, dates, actually, all right? So, tomorrow for breakfast, you say, I want the double the greens portion. Give me all more extra greens, absolutely. Again, bananas uh, don't even make the, uh, the top thousand. In fact, if you look at the next leading cause of death, bananas could be down by dangerous. Show number six, like oh, almost harmless disease. You know, 20 years ago, what's been in the top 10? Four million Americans affected. According to the latest dietary guidelines for the prevention of Alzheimer's disease, the two most important things we can do in terms of diet, number one, minimize our intake of meat, dairy, and junk, and maximize our intake of vegetables, legumes, your beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, fruits and whole grains. This is based in part on data going back decades now showing that people who eat meat, red meat, white meat, doesn't matter, between two to three times higher risk of becoming demented later in life and the longer one eats healthy, the lower one's risk fall. Killer number seven is type two diabetes, a disease we've known that we can reverse, not just prevent and treat, but reverse with plant-based diet. Back in the 1930s, a small group of diabetics put on a plant-based diet, some form of plant-based diet, and uh, within a period of five years, a quarter of the, about a quarter of the diabetics were able to get off insulin altogether. But you know, plant-based diet tend to be relatively low-calorie diet. So look, maybe their diabetes just got better because they lost so much weight. I mean, to tease that out, what you'd have to do is put people on a healthy diet, but force them to eat so much food that they don't lose any weight. Then we could see if there's unique benefits to plant-based eating beyond just all the easy weight loss. Well, we'd have to wait a few decades, but here it is. Subjects are weight every day, and if they start to lose weight, they're made to eat more food. In fact, so much more food, some of the participants had problems eating it all, they're like, oh, not another salad. <laughs> but eventually they adapted, so no weight loss, despite restricting meat, eggs, dairy, and junk. Okay, so with zero weight loss, was there still any benefit for their diabetes? Well, insulin needs were cut 60% across the board. Half the diabetics ended off, ended off all their insulin altogether. Wow, how many years did that take? No, 16 days. 16 days later. So we're talking diabetics. We've had diabetes for as long as uh, 20 years, injecting 20 units of insulin a day, then 13 days later on, none. Diabetes, for 20 years, then off all insulin in less than two weeks. Diabetes for 20 years because no one had told them about a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. 
They had not been on the holistic cruise. <laughs> For decades, they were just 13 days away at any time from being free. Wow. It's just been number 15, 32 units of insulin on the control diet, then 18 days later on none. Lower blood sugars, I'm, 30, I'm 32 units less insulin. That's the power of plans. And remember, this was with zero weight loss. His body just started working that much better because he was eating the right food. Ah, but what about the side effects? Oh, you mean like cholesterol is dropping like a rock to under 150 on average, making it essentially heart attack proof too? You know, so just like asking patients to make moderate changes in diet, only net moderate benefits in terms of cholesterol reduction, how moderate do you want your diabetes? Right? Everything in moderation may be a truer statement than many people realize. Right? Asking our diabetic patients, to make moderate changes in diet can leave them with moderate blindness, <laughs> moderate kidney failure, moderate amputation, maybe just a few toes or something. <laughs> Moderation in all things not necessarily a good thing. Remember that study purported to show that diets, high meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful and healthy smoking supposedly suggested those in middle age who eat lots of meat, eggs, and dairy four times as likely to die from cancer and diabetes. That was true for cancer. But if you look at the actual study, simply not true for diabetes. Those eating lots of animal protein during middle age didn't have four times the risk of dying from diabetes. They had 73 times the risk of dying from diabetes. Now those that chose moderation, only eating a moderate amount of animal protein, oh, they just had 23 times the risk of death from diabetes. Killer number eight is kidney failure. Um, uh, we, um, uh, a, which uh, plant-based diet can use to both prevent and treat. No wonder, because kidneys are highly vascular organs. Harvard researchers found three, and only three, dietary risk factors for declining kidney function. Number one, animal protein. Number two, animal fat. Number three, cholesterol. Not fat in general, not protein in general. Specifically animal protein fat, all three of which only found one place um, in animal products. Animal fat can alter the actual structure of our kidneys based on autopsy studies like this, showing plugs of fat literally clogging up the works in autopsy human kidneys. And animal protein um, uh, can affect, profoundly affect normal human kidney function, inducing something called hyperfiltration, increasing the workload on the kidney, but not plant protein. So you take people, give them a single meal of tuna fish, Single meal of tuna fish, you get increased pressure in their kidneys one, two, three hours after the meal of both non-diabetics and diabetics. Okay, but what if you gave them the exact same amount of protein, but instead of a tuna fish salad sandwich, you gave them a tofu salad sandwich? What happens? Absolutely nothing. Body can handle plant protein without even batting an eyelash. So wait a second. How, why does the animal protein cause that overload reaction, but not the plant protein? We think it's because the inflammation triggered by the consumption of animal products. How do we know that? So you give people an anti-inflammatory drug along with that tuna fish, you can abolish that hyperfiltration protein leakage response to meat ingestion. And then there's the acid load, the consumption of acid-inducing foods, meat, eggs, and dairy, um, uh, can uh, cause something called tubular toxicity, damage to the delicate urine-making tubes within the kidneys. Um, animal foods tend to be acid-forming, particularly fish, which is the worst, then pork, poultry, on down the list, whereas plant foods tend to either be kind of neutral or actually base-forming, alkaline, particularly dark green leafy vegetables, to counteract some of the acids formed um, from the rest of our diet. So maybe the key to halting progression of chronic kidney disease may lie in the farmer's market or the produce um, uh, market, not the farm seed. So no wonder, of course, that uh, plant-based diets have been used to actually treat 
um, kidney failure for decades now. Here's um, um, uh, a, uh, what typically, um, uh, this is measuring protein leakage on a typical low sodium diet. That's typically what we physicians would put people on with declining kidney function. Then they switched them to the supplemented vegan diet, then back to um, conventional diet, plant-based. Conventional, plant-based. Switching on and off kidney dysfunction like a light switch based on what was going into their mouth. Killer number nine is respiratory tract infections like pneumonia. Now, what possible role could um, diet play in respiratory? Obviously, you haven't seen my video, Kale and the Immune System, talking about the immunostimulatory effects of kale. Is there anything kale cannot do? <laughs> Boosting antibody production sevenfold. Yeah, but there's in a petri dish. What about people? You take older men and women, split them up into two groups. Half can eat their regular diet, the other half you just give a few extra servings of fruits and vegetables right before getting their pneumovax vaccination, their pneumonia vaccination, significantly boosted protective antibody response, significantly improved immune function, just giving extra pre fresh produce, right? This isn't removing meat, nothing. Just giving people some extra fruits and vegetables every day can significantly improve immune function, which for certain uh, populations like the elderly can be literally life. <coughs> Say, Killer number 10 is suicide. You know, we've known for a long time that people who eat healthier tend to feel healthier. In fact, only about half of the depression, anxiety, and stress scores compared to those who eat um, uh, uh, a more typical diets. Um, but you don't know until you put it to the test. I mean, is, is it possible that you know, people that healthier people just tend to eat healthier, um, or is it actually a cause and effect relationship? You don't know to put it to the test. What they thought was happening was that it was the arachidonic acid, this long chain inflammatory omega 6 fatty acid found predominantly um, in uh, chicken and eggs, by far the most, also beef, sausage, on down the list, found in all animal products, but particularly chicken and eggs. So, what researchers at the University of Arizona did. So they took people, removed um, uh, eggs, removed uh, chicken, removed other meat from people's diet, got a significant improvement in mood within just two weeks. I right, can take a drug to months to take an effect, significant improvement within just two weeks. And so what they thought was happening was that this arachidonic acid stuff um, was adversely impacting mental health via a cascade of neuroinflammation, brain inflammation. But we may be able to clear this inflammation from our brains within as few as two weeks by cutting down our consumption of eggs, chicken, and other meat. Wait a second, am I just cherry picking here? What about all the other studies that have, you know, proven that, you know, uh, different diets have, uh, have improved mood? Well, there aren't any. So here's a better analysis. All the studies that have ever been done, only one um, study has ever shown this kind of ran rigorous randomized controlled um, trial um, to significantly improve mood under any study uh, duration, and that was this trial of a plant-based diet. It's kind of hard to cherry pick when there's only one cherry. <laughs> Works in a workplace setting too. This is uh, Neil Barnett's wonderful work at PCRM. They went to Geico Insurance um, um, in DC, where we both live, um, and uh, basically just offered you know, weekly educational sessions, added healthy options to the cafeterias, got significant improvements, not only physical function, general health, vitality, all the things you'd expect from eating plant based, but also significant improvements in mental health. Um, and so, uh, and this actually translated into improved worker productivity, which is presumably what the com company was really interested in. So they took it nationwide. Uh, ten corporate sites across uh, the country, um, half continued to do whatever they were doing before. The other half, again, just added these free um, weekly educational um, seminars, very similar to what's happening here um, this week. Um, and they just added lentil soup, bean burritos, just some healthy options in the cafeteria to give people um, the opportunity to eat healthier and what happened. Um, um, those um, at those, uh, lucky to be enough at those sites, where they actually came into the intervention, significant improvements, depression, anxiety, fatigue, emotional well-being, daily functioning, emotional health. Um, and so 
you know, lifestyle interventions like exercise, for example, can significantly boost mood, um, uh, not, just, uh, not just physical health, but mental health as well. And in terms of diet, the most powerful thing yeah, we've discovered is a plant-based um, nutritional profile. Killer number 11, actually blood-borne infections. Not sure there are certain, uh, you know, uh, meat-borne bacteria that can, you know, burrow through the intestinal wall, get into your bloodstream, and, and cause a, a blood and systemic blood infections. But in women, um, um, uh, these uh, bacteria can crawl up into the bladder. We've known for decades now that it's actually bacteria crawling up from the rectum that causes bladder infections in women. But we didn't know where this reservoir of bladder-infected E. coli was coming from, but now we do. Chicken. Uh, we now have DNA fingerprinting proof. Um, that um, have a direct link uh, between um, uh, these uh, farm animals, meat, and bladder infections in women, a, uh, a solid evidence that urinary tract infections lead to what's called a, a zoonosis, an animal to human disease. You say, wait a second, like, who undercooks chicken? I mean, can't you just you know, use a meat thermometer, cook the meat through? What's the big deal? Well, cross contamination is the big deal. So if you take 40 families, give them a frozen chicken to prepare and cook in their homes they normally would. Multitudes of antibiotic resistant bacteria jump from the chicken into the guts of the volunteers even before it was eaten. So, look, they could have they incinerated that chicken to ash. They didn't have to eat any of it. All they, I mean, they were infected before they ever made it into the pot. Um, uh, and within weeks, um, these uh, um, uh, um, antibiotic resistant um, uh, chicken bugs were uh, multiplying to the point of a, that uh, were becoming a, a major part of the person's gut flora. Chicken bugs were like taking over uh, the person's um, intestines. Um, so, okay, well, wait a sec. What if we not just uh, you know, teach people how to do um, safe cooking techniques, but also safe handling techniques? So, what they did is they came in. Um, instructed people on the official USDA recommendation, what we should all be doing. Anyone who has any kind of fresh or frozen poultry, they should be, you should be spraying down all common kitchen surfaces with a bleach solution. Oh um, so they God. came in, they told people how to do this, showed people how to do this, and then they did the same thing. Gave them a frozen chicken, you know, um, and still um, uh, afterwards swapped around their kitchen and could find significant amounts of Salmonella Campylobacter. These are both serious. Human pathogens affect salmonella is the number one cause of foodborne related death and hospitalization in the country on some utensils, dishcloth, around the counter, around the sink, rim, on the, on the cupboard. So um, uh, the reason that people tend to have more bacteria from feces in their kitchen sink compared to their toilet seats <laughs> is because people tend to rinse chickens in the sink, not the toilet. <laughs> Chicken not in any pot, just a <laughs> All right, but uh, the good news is, is, look, it's not like you eat chicken once and you're colonized for life. In this uh, study, chicken bacteria only seemed to last for about 10 days before the person's good bacteria could muscle it out of the way. The problem is that many families eat chicken more than once every 10 days, so maybe constantly reintroducing these chicken bugs in their system where they can lay in wait in their rectum um, and then months later crawl up um, and cause millions of urinary tract infections every year, some of which can come, become quite serious. They can move to the kidneys, get into the bloodstream, and even become life-threatening. Say, wait a second. Now you can't sell unsafe cars. You can't sell unsafe toys. Toy. Toys? <laughs> How is it even illegal to sell unsafe meat? Well, they do it by blaming the consumers. Right? Raw meats are not idiot proof, says one USDA poultry microbiologist. They can be mishandled when they're like handling a hand grenade. You pull the pin, so I'm going to get hurt. Now, while well, some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets, <laughs> our, um, our, our poultry microbiologists disagree, saying, no, it's the consumer's responsibility. They just refuse to accept it, right? Whoa. It's like a car company saying, yeah, we install faulty brakes, but it's your fault for not putting your kid in a seatbelt or something. The head of the CDC's food poisoning division famously responded to this blame the victim attitude coming from the meat industry. Is it reasonable? Is it reasonable, she asked, 
that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies. Is that reasonable? Not to worry, the meat industry's on it. They now have FDA approval for a, ba for a uh, bacteria eating virus they can spray on the meat. Um, these so-called bacteriophages. Um, the industry is a bit concerned about consumer acceptance of these so-called bac uh, bacteria eating viruses. May present some of a, of a challenge um, uh, to the food industry. Um, well, they think that's going to be a challenge. Check out their other bright idea. <laughs> The effect of extracted elsewhere, but this is a sciencey way of saying they want to smear a maggot mixture on the meat, but it's a low cost, it's a thing. Think about it! <laughs> Look, maggots you know, thrive off of rotting flesh, however, well, there have been no reports of maggots having any serious diseases, so hey, they must be filled with some kind of antibacterial something, right? Have you ever seen a maggot sneeze? I didn't think so. so Let's take some maggots, grow them three days old, wash them off, time on a little Vitamix action here. Voila! Safer meat. All right, you talk about kidney failure, what about liver failure? We've known for decades. We cannot just prevent, uh, help prevent, but treat liver failure. Um, uh, by uh, eating, uh, by giving people plant-based diets, significantly reducing the toxins that would otherwise build up in their bloodstream without a fully functional liver to detoxify their blood. Although uh, one does have to admit there are some people consuming plant-based diets with worsening kidney failure, excuse me, liver failure. They're called alcoholics, living off of potatoes and corn and grapes and, and strictly plant-based, but not doing so good. We're not sure exactly what. <clears throat> uh. Kill number 13 is high blood pressure. 78 million Americans affected. That's about one in three American adults. And as we get older, our pressures get higher and higher, such that by age 60, most of us have high blood pressure. Say, so, wait a second, I mean, if most of us get hypertension when we get older, maybe it's less a disease and more just a natural, inevitable consequence of aging. No, we've known since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. Measure um, a blood pressure for thousands of people living in rural Kenya, a typical Kenyan diet, something like this. Lots of corn and beans and vegetables, fruit, greens. Our pressures go up as we age, such that by age 60, most of us have high blood pressure, their blood pressures go down. And the lower, the better. Um, uh, the, um, uh, we, now have, uh, we now have evidence that even people under 120 over 80 may benefit from blood pressure reduction. So the ideal blood pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further, blood pressure, 110 over 70. 110, is it even possible to get pressures down to 110 over 70? It's not just possible, it's normal for those living healthy enough lives. A few years in this rural Kenyan hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. Oh, how many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Zero. Ah, they must have low rates of heart disease, right? No, they had no rates of heart disease. Not a single case of atherosclerosis on a born killer was found. Rural China, same thing, right? As we learned from the China study. Um, uh, so about 110 over 70s their entire lives, 70 year olds, same average blood pressure as 16 year old. So wait a second. African diet, Asian diet, I mean, these are vastly different diets. What they shared in common was that they're plant-based day to day with meat only on special occasions. So what do you say? Why do we think it's the, it's the, it's the plant-based nature of their diets that was so protected? Because in the Western world, the only groups of folks getting it down that low on average, according to the American Heart Association, were those eating strictly plant-based diets, coming in with an average 110 over 65. Here's the largest study of plant-based eaters to date is the famous Adventist II study looking at 89,000 Californians comparing non-vegetarians to so-called semi-vegetarians or flexitarians, people that eat meat more like on a once a week basis rather than a daily basis, just a few times a month, uh, versus those we know meat except fish 
compared to those who eat no meat at all, compared to those who eat no meat, eggs, or dairy. And this was an Adventist study, so even the non-vegetarians didn't eat a lot of meat compared to the regular population, ate lots of fruits and vegetables, tended not to smoke, exercise. This is a very healthy cohort of meat eaters, but still, we see this stepwise drop in risk the more and more plant-based people ate. Same thing with diabetes. Same thing with obesity. Right? So sure, you can show the, throw the vast majority of your risk out the window by eating strictly plant-based, but it's not all or nothing, not black or white. Any movement we can make along this spectrum towards eating healthier may accrue significant benefits. Experimentally, you can show this uh, for like high blood pressure taking vegetarians. You give them meat, pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Or you take people who already eat meat, remove meat from their diet, and their blood pressures go down within, se within all seven days. And this is after the vast majority had to stop their blood pressure medications or reduce their blood pressure medications they had to. Right? Otherwise, because they became so rapidly over-medicated. Once you treat the cause, you can't have normal blood pressure on multiple blood pressure pills. You drop your pressure too low, you can get dangerous, you can get dizzy, fall over, hurt yourself. Right? So lower pressures on fewer drugs. That's the power of plants. So, does the American Heart Association recommend a no-meat diet? No, they recommend a low-meat diet, the so-called DASH diet. Um, uh, so wait a second, when this DASH diet was being created, I mean, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's Frank Sachs? And no, they were aware. The chair of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. See, the DASH diet was created with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure lowering benefits of a more plant based diet, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general population. They didn't think the public could handle the truth. Now, you can see what they were thinking. Just like, you know, drugs never work unless you actually take them, right? Diets never work at all unless you actually eat them. So like, look, how many people are going to eat strictly plant-based? You know, if we soft pedal the message, Right, come up with some kind of compromise diet, well then on a population scale, maybe we'll do more good. Okay, tell that to the thousand American families a day that lose a loved one to high blood pressure. Maybe it's time to start telling the American public the truth. Parkinson's disease, does a, does a, might a plant-based diet reduce one's risk of Parkinson's disease? But we know that most studies done to date have found this link between dairy product consumption and increased risk of Parkinson's. So wait a second, why might that be? Well, um, uh, the, um, uh, there's evidence of contamination of our milk supply with neurotoxic chemicals. Um, so you find high levels of these uh, organochlorine uh, pesticide residues found in not, not only in milk, but also um, in the particular parts of, uh, of uh, Parkinson's brains on Alzheimer's, uh, excuse me, on autopsy, um, that are involved in, the, uh, in the, the, the generation of Parkinson's disease. They're talking about pollutants like tetrahydrosoquinolone, um, which is what scientists actually use to create Parkinson's in primates in a laboratory setting, but mostly in cheese, actually. Um, uh, so there's been calls in the dairy industry to pretty please test their products for toxins. Good luck with that. Of course, you can just not eat it, but then what would happen to your bone? <laughs> That's a marketing ploy. If you look at the actual science, milk does not appear to protect against hip fracture risk. Whether you're drinking as an adult, whether you're drinking as a teen, doesn't matter, it doesn't work, it may actually increase. Um, uh, bone fracture risk, which could explain why countries with the light, highest milk consumption, like in Scandinavia, um, have a, a, among the highest um, um, hip fracture rates. So Swedish researchers decided to put it to the test. More than 100,000 men and women followed for years, and milk drinking women at higher rates of death from all causes put together, meaning milk drinking women live significantly shorter lives, significantly more heart attacks and strokes, more cancer 
for each daily glass of milk. Of those women uh, unfortunate enough to be drinking three glasses of milk every day, um, nearly twice as likely of dying prematurely. Um, and milk drinking men also had higher rates of death. Uh, you know, but for some reason you don't see uh, you know ads like this. I don't know. Oh, where's my? Oh, here's the. Here's the ads like this <coughs> on TV. So much. Oh, um, uh, but that uh, last slide. No, but so and milk drinking women also had higher rates of hip fractures. So more milk, more fractures, um, and then men also had higher rates of death. And killer number 15 is uh, some called aspiration pneumonia caused by swallowing difficulties due to Parkinson's stroke, Alzheimer's, things we've already talked about. Okay, so here's our top 15 leading causes of death. And a plant-based diet can help prevent nearly all of them, help um, treat more than half of them, and even reverse the course of disease, and some of them included in some cases, our top three killers. Look, there are certainly drugs that can help too. There's a lot of cholesterol lowering drugs, all sorts of things for hard. Yeah, there's insulin injections, all sorts of sugar pills for diabetes, all sorts of categories, families of high blood pressure medications. But the same diet does it all. But it's not like there's some kind of heart healthy diet that's somehow different from a brain healthy diet. No, a liver healthy diet is a kidney healthy diet is a whole body healthy diet. One diet to rule them all. Mm -hmm. And you know, what about side effects? Drug side effects, not talking about a little rash here or something. Prescription drugs kill more than 100,000 Americans every year. Right? And this is not overdoses. This is not like medical mistakes. No. Um, this is to people taking drugs as prescribed. No. Killing off more than 100,000. That wasn't an added side effect. It was a good, good time. I don't know this might. Um, uh, so wait a second, 100,000 Americans dying every year? Wait a second, that means that the sixth leading kill in the United States is doctor. The sixth leading cause of death wow. is me. Thankfully, I can be prevented with a plant-based diet. <laughs> um, but actually, if you... Um, uh, so actually, I talk about this in my in chapter 15, how not to die. This is called, uh, you know, uh, doctor-induced deaths or, or healthcare-related deaths, iatrogenic deaths. And actually, if you add in the medical mistakes and unnecessary surgeries and deaths from those kind of infections, all these other things, and doctors not washing their hands, etc. Actually, healthcare is the number three leading killer in the United States. It's actually a conservative estimate. Um, uh, whereas, uh, so. Um, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, compared to uh, 20,000 um, uh, 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 American vegetarians, those of eating meat are about twice as likely to be on aspirin, twice as likely to be on sleeping pills, tranquilizers, and acids, painkillers, blood pressure medications, laxatives, of course, um, as well as insulin. So, you know, plant-based diets are great for people that don't like taking drugs, for people that don't like paying for drugs, for people that don't like risking drug side effects. Um, so, um, um, uh, so here we are, right? Anyone want to solve the health care crisis? I do have a suggestion. Right? Most deaths in the United States um, are preventable and related to nutrition. This is a global burden of disease study. The largest study of human risk factors in history, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, found the number one cause of death in the United States is the American diet. Number one cause of disability in the United States in terms of healthy years of life lost wow. our diet. Now bumping tobacco smoking to number two, cigarettes not only kill about a half a million Americans every year, whereas our diet kills hundreds of thousands more. So if most deaths are preventable and related to nutrition, then obviously, right, nutrition is the number one thing taught in medical school, right? Wow. I mean, obviously, nutrition is the number one thing your doctor talks to you about at every single visit, right? How could there be this disconnect between the science and the practice of medicine? Well, let's do a thought experiment. Imagine yourself a smoker back in the 1950s. You know, back in the 50s, 
the average per capita cigarette consumption, 4,000 cigarettes a year. I mean, the average person walking around smoked half pack a day on average. The media was telling people to smoke famous athletes, agreed, even Santa Claus wanted you to smoke. I mean, look, you want to keep fit and stay slender, so make sure to smoke. And eat lots of hot dogs to stay trim, and eat lots of sugar to stay slim and trim a lot better than that apple there. I mean, sheesh, right? Though apples do connote goodness and freshness, reads one internal tobacco industry memo, which brings up many possibilities for youth oriented They want to make apple-flavored cigarettes for kids. Wow. Shameless. For digestion's sake, you smoke. I mean, no curative power is claimed by Philip Morris, but hey, better be safe than sorry, and smoke. Blow in her face, and she'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> says, no, they're so round, so firm, so fully packed. Wow. After all, John Wayne smoked them until he got a little lung cancer and died. You know, back then, even the paleo folks were smoking. And so were the doctors. Now, this is not to say there wasn't controversy in the medical profession. Sure, you know, some doctors smoke camels, but others uh, preferred lucky. So as a little disagreement there, the leader of the U.S. Senate agreed. Who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation? Not a single case of throat irritation. How could there be when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you wow. drink? Which was Maybe not very pure. <laughs> But don't worry, if your throat does get irritated, your doctor can just write you a prescription for cigarettes. This is in the Journal of the American Medical what? Association. So when the AMA was saying that smoking on balance was good for you, where could you turn back then when you just wanted the facts? What's the new data advanced by science? Well, she was too tired for fun, and then she smoked a camel. <laughs> Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive medical science, uh, that is, when he still could speak before he died of throat cancer. Now, by some miracle back then, there was some smokingfacts.org website that could deliver the science directly, bypassing commercially corruptible wow. institutional filters. You would have come aware of studies like this. This Adventist study out of California in 1958 showing non-smokers had at least 90% less lung cancer than smokers. This wasn't the first. You know, when famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why his studies back in the 30s linking lung cancer and smoking were simply ignored off the face of the earth, he had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was everywhere. It was in the movies, on airplanes, right? Medical meetings were one heavy haze of smoke. Smoking was, in a word, normal. So, back to our little thought experiment here. If you're a smoker in the 50s in the know, what do you do? I mean, with access uh, to the yeah. science, you realize the best available balance of evidence is just your smoking habit, uh, not so good for you. So do you change? Or do you wait? I mean, if you wait until your doctor tells you between puffs to quit, you can have cancer. If you wait until the powers that be officially recognize it, like the Surgeon General did in the subsequent decade, you can be dead by then. It took more than 7,000 studies in the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General's report against smoking came out. You think maybe after the first 6,000 studies, it could give people a little heads up or something? Powerful industry. Maybe we should have stopped smoking after the 700th study like this. As a smoker in the 50s, on one hand, you had all of society, the government, the medical profession itself telling you to smoke. And on the other hand, all you had was the science. If you're even aware of studies like this, 
Now let's fast forward 55 years. You know, there's a new adventure study out of California warning Americans about something else they may be putting in their mouths. Of course, it's not just one study, put all the studies together, and deaths from all causes put together. Many of our dreaded diseases significantly lower among those even more plant based. So, instead of someone going along with America's smoking habits in the 50s, imagine you, or someone you know, someone you care about, going along with America's eating habits today. What do you do? I mean, with excess to the science, you realize the best level balance of evidence suggests eating habits not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? I mean, if you wait until your doctor tells you between bites to change, it'll be too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report came out, the AMA still dragged their feet. The American Medical Association officially refused to endorse the Surgeon General's report. Why? Couldn't have been because they just handed a $10 million check for the tobacco industry? Hmm, maybe. Wow. Okay, so you can see why the AMA was sucking up to the tobacco industry, but why weren't more individual doctors speaking up? Well, there were a few ahead of their time speaking up against industries killing millions, but why not more? Maybe it's because the majority of physicians themselves smoke Same cigarettes. with eating meat. Just like the majority of physicians today continue to eat foods that are contributing to our epidemics and dietary disease. What was the AMA's rallying cry back then? Everything in moderation. Extensive scientific studies have proven smoking in moderation. Oh, that's fine. Sound familiar? Yeah. The food industry used the same tobacco and food tactics, twisting information. Uh, misinformation, twisting the science. The same, the same scientists for hire paid to downplay the risks of toxic chemicals and cigarettes are the same paid for by the National Confectioners Association to downplay the risks of candy and the same paid for by the meat industry to downplay the risks of meat. Whereas animal products and processed foods are killing off at least 14 million people every year. Those of us in this room involved in this evidence-based nutrition revolution. We're talking about 14 million lives in the balance. So maybe plant-based nutrition should be considered kind of the nutritional equivalent of stopping smoking. Uh, but how long do we have to wait before the, before the powers that be say, uh, don't wait for open-heart surgery uh, before starting to eat healthier as well? Until the system changes, we need to really take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health, for our patient's health. We can't wait until society catches up to the science again because it's a matter of life and death. You know, Dr. Kim Williams, oh, got to get him on the show. Um, Dr. Kim Williams, Kim president of the American College of Cardiology, um, a few years back, you know, he was asked in an interview why he himself follows the same diet he recommends to all his patients, a strictly plant-based diet. I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my own fault. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.